Heavenly Father, as we go into this time now, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be here. We always invite you to be a part of our congregation, Lord. And I pray that you will speak to hearts and that your workings will be made plain. As we open your word this morning, I ask if it be your will that you will bless each one of us, that we might understand something new, something deeper about your love for us individually. And I, Lord, I pray especially that the words that I speak today will be your words and not my own, is my prayer. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Friends, I want to welcome again each one of you that are here, whether you've been coming for 30 years or you're a brand new visitor just for first today. I pray that you gain a special experience with God from coming into his house on his Sabbath day. And I especially want to welcome those who are on, uh, face, watching on Facebook or perhaps on uh, YouTube or on my website. Friends, we pray that you too will receive a wonderful blessing as we spend this time with the Lord this morning. It was World War I. And we saw that the Allied forces and the enemy forces were doing their thing, fighting with each other. But I want to uh, refer you this morning to a specific strategic action that the Allies used to take. And this is really quite interesting because I knew it happened in World War II, but I didn't realise they did this in World War I. What they would do in World War I is they'd get a bunch of sticks and they'd nail them all together and they'd cover it with hessian and then they'd get their paintbrushes out and they would paint them to make them look exactly like tanks. And what they would do is with these tanks, you could easily pick it up with two men and you could move them to a place and they'd lay them all out on the ground in various places. And so when the enemy spies would come, either flying over in their biplanes or whoever they might be, they would see all these tanks in these strategic locations and radio back to their headquarters on the other side and say, don't attack here because they're well fortified, not realising that they were just Hessian. And as we move into World War II, we see the same thing being done again. It must have proven very successful in World War I, only in World War II they were a little bit more modern, so they had ones that you could blow up. And they actually had to nail them to the ground so they didn't blow away in the wind. But when you see these, uh, these blow up pneumatic tanks from a distance, they painted them with numbers and everything to make them completely legitimate and they looked exactly the same as a real tank. Now if you have a thousand of these laying out on a big field or in strategic positions on a battlefield, the enemy would see them and say, well, we're not going to attack over there, we're going to attack over here, which is exactly what the Allies wanted them to do. So it was a wonderful way of camouflage. And uh, these uh, tanks, I've seen photographs of them and watched YouTube clips where you see a tank sitting on the ground and two men come over, one at the front, one at the back, and they just lift it up and they walk over here and then they put it down again. The most amazing thing you might ever see. Do you know, it must have been a very, very successful ploy, a very, very successful deception, because even as late as the recent US operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, they had to, they again made these dummy tanks, but they had to make them even more sophisticated, so they had to put heaters inside them to make it look like they were hot because the enemy had infrared cameras and they could tell whether they were hot or not. And you know, that often um, satellites can look at ships at sea and if they see a heat bloom coming out of the engine room, they can say, oh, well, that ship's getting ready to sail. So they'd have these little radiators, these little heat generators sitting inside the, the blow up tank to create heat. So when the enemy looked at it in their infrared cameras, they would see something that looked like it was getting ready to move. Deception, camouflage, lies. The purpose of this, what was the purpose of it and why was it so successful? To deceive the enemy into making mistakes that would cost them the war by making them believe that something was real was actually a lie. 
The counterfeit was so realistic that it could not be distinguished from the genuine. That's the important part. The counterfeit was so realistic that it could not be distinguished from the genuine. Now friends, you might not have realised this morning, but we're going to be continuing on our journey through the three angels' messages today. And you might remember that we looked at the first angel's message and we've only looked at half, the first half of the second angel's message. So as a short recap, let's have a look and see what we looked at in previous sermons for those who perhaps weren't here or didn't hear. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Please turn there with me. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. And we need to remember why these messages are so important. Why are they so important? Because it is the reason that you are all sitting here today. It is the reason for the existence of our church. It is the reason why we come, we study the Bible, to learn what these three messages are, because they are present truth for this day that need to be delivered to the world. The first angel's message, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, and I make no apologies for reading this again. I'm using the King James Version, and I want to read this so many times that you can look at it and you can say, oh, I know this because you've heard it so many times through repetition. Verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. The relevant points that we covered in this message. The angel is delivering this most important gospel message just to those of us in Australia. Is that what the message says? I can see a lot of heads going like this. You've been listening. It is to go to the whole world and not only to the whole world, but it is to go to the whole world with a loud voice. This is something that is important to everybody across the globe. The timing of this message is also important because remember it was just leading up to the conclusion of the 2300 days of the book of Daniel. And what happened at the end of the 2300 days of the book of Daniel? We see that there was a judgment that was to occur in the year 1844. And it says also to fear God, give glory to him and worship him. So what is the key to this message? If you were going to say that there was one word that we could use to say that this message has to do with this, it would be worship. It's all about worship, friends. It's all about worship. And that point I want you to keep in your minds because it's going to be important to what we look at today in the second angel's message. How do we worship God? Do we remember? We saw in previous sermons, we worship God by reflecting his image through the residing power of his Holy Spirit in our lives and through obedience to his law. Remember what we said before. Nothing is so important, nothing is so effective in reaching the unreached than to show the image of Christ in your life so they can see it in a living way. So they can see Jesus in you. Friends, you can't do it yourself. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit, the abiding power of the Holy Spirit resting in you. If this is the power of the gospel, these things that we've spoken about so far, then we would expect to have a warning in the second angel's message. God has told us, this is who I want you to be. This is what I want you to do. This is the direction that I want you to go. But I also want you to watch out for something that's coming. You remember we spoke about that. In the second angel's message, let us read Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. Just the first half of verse 8. 
And another angel followed, followed the first angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Now, you might remember in the last sermon that we had on this topic in January, we looked at the identification of who Babylon was. And if we go, friends, to the book of Revelation, chapter 17, we find a detailed description of God pointing and saying, look at these characteristics that I've laid out for you and then look in the world and see if there's anything there that matches this characteristics. And friends, we found that there was only one thing that, ma that matched those characteristics and I'm sorry if I am overshooting myself for those who weren't here for that sermon. But for those of you who were here, we know who it was. It was a modern day church. It was a church that was global in its reach. It was a church that had the interest of most of the world. And we know who we're talking about, don't we? Friends, it's the papal system. The papal church system. Why am I saying system? Why do I say the world system? Because as a reminder, I want to make sure you clearly understand that I'm not talking about people. When we get to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, God says, Come out of her, my people. So God even sees that he has true-hearted Christians who believe they are doing the right thing inside this papal system. And so we need to be very, very careful how we talk about these people, how we treat them, because God says, these are my people. And we know what happened in the Old Testament when God's people, the Israelites, were attacked by those who were not his people. Friends, let's be careful. Let's be careful. So we see that the first half of the second angel's message, we have identified Babylon. Now we're going to continue the investigation of the second angel's message. We will continue now and notice some further detail regarding the actions and the status and the behaviour of this system. Let me reread for you now. Revelation chapter 14 verse 8. Now we've come to this point just before I read because I wanted you to remember the context of what we're looking at here. God has deliver us, uh, delivered to us a wonderful message, a salvation message, a message in the first angel's message, uh, in the first angel's message, a message that is the foundation of the Adventist church. And now he's saying, this is what I want you to watch out for, because he wants us to grasp this salvation. Let's have a look and see. The second angel's message in verse 8. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Why is she fallen? Because she has made all nations, how many nations? All nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now friends, when the Bible says fallen, we know what fallen means. Well, we're going to look at what fallen means. But when it says, is fallen, is fallen twice, what does that mean? It means great was her fall and there will be no resurrection, so to speak. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And here's the reason. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, there are some points that I want you to consider in this passage. Number one, the angel in this verse, unlike the verse in the first angel's message, is not speaking with a loud voice. It just says, a third angel followed them saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. He wasn't flying in the midst of heaven. It wasn't a message to the entire world and it was not spoken with a loud voice. So we are to know this truth, but we are not necessarily to shout it out to the whole world as though it's the principle of our first message, because it is not. The angel in the second angel's message is not speaking with a loud voice, but saying. So what is the significance of that? 
It means the first angel's message is to go to the entire world as the everlasting gospel to all nations, tribes, tongues and peoples. But the second angel's message is for perhaps a smaller group of people, a knowledge and a something that will increase our faith. No loud voice, no nations, no kindreds, tongues and peoples. So to whom is this message meant to go? Ideally, who is it meant to go to? And it makes perfect sense that this message is for those who have heard and accepted the first angel's message. God's last day people. Why do I say that? You know, sometimes we can get a little bit wrapped up in things and we can say, well, this is the way we've always done this, but I'm sure God wouldn't mind if we moved that way. So you're travelling down a road, the straight road of truth, and then you might make, decide to make a one degree turn, just a tiny little bit like that. No one's going to notice. But what happens when you're 100 miles down the track? This finger's pointing to Melbourne, that one's in Adelaide. Can you see? So God is making sure that those who accept the first angel's message recognise the importance of keeping the obedience and keeping the power of the Holy Spirit in their life to guide them. Let's have a look and see. Because the second angel's message is a warning, it is a warning against a counterfeit that's going to be put in place for the first angel's message. Now, I've often said to people, have you ever met the devil? Now imagine in your mind that a being comes to you, he's red, he's got claws, he's got a big tail, he's got horns and a pitchfork. You're going to look at him and you're going to say, ha, 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 I know who you are, get away from me. But friends, as we saw in the beginning story, Satan doesn't come to us that way. He comes to us as a well-dressed counterfeit. He might look like a Christian. He might smell like a Christian. He might talk like a Christian. But we need to be very, very careful. And in fact, I would suggest to each one of you that whatever I say to you in this sermon, make sure you go to your Bibles. And if there's something that I say that you don't think is right, come to me and say, Pastor, it says in the Bible here, and friends, I might be wrong, but I'll be overjoyed that you're studying your Bible. Because that is what God wants us to do. So this concept of this counterfeit, the state of Babylon is a counterfeit church, as we have already seen. But it is fallen, fallen, two times, not just one. And we're going to investigate what this could possibly mean just in a moment, because the verse continues to tell us that she fell because of something. And that gives us the reason. She fell, and this is why. <sighs> she fell because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's the key. Friends, if we should drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, we too will fall. This is the warning that God is giving us. God is saying to you, stay straight on the needle, stay straight on the path pointing directly to north. Don't deviate one degree, left or right. So let's have a look at this. Her wine and her fornication appear to be the key elements. She holds out the glass of wine of the wrath of her fornication. You know, I've had a, a look through the scriptures regarding wine in terms of it being a doctrine of some sort, and there's not a lot there. But there is a verse in there, and we're going to have a look at that, Jeremiah 51 verse 7. There is a verse in the Bible that talks about the effect that wine would have on you. And we see in Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 7, there is a very interesting verse there that's actually talking about Babylon. It's talking about drinking her wine and what the result of drinking that wine is. Jeremiah 51 and verse 7, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. 
The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you've seen someone who's under the influence of alcohol. They can't learn anything. You can't teach them anything. They can't drive a car because they are deranged. It changes the way they think. It changes the mind. It changes the processes. And it's interesting when we read this verse in Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 7, it's almost like reading an extension of the second angel's message because it talks about Babylon. It talks about the cup. It talks about all the earth. It talks about drinking the wine and it talks about the result of drinking that wine which makes the nations deranged. But we need to ask ourselves the question. We still haven't got to the nub of this yet. Yes, you take the wine from Babylon. Yes, you drink it. Yes, you are deranged. Yes, it calls you a great fall. But what is the wine? What is it that Babylon is offering the world that makes them deranged. The Bible is clear and it is commonly accepted that God represents his relationship with his people in the context of one of the closest relationships that you can have and that is the relationship of marriage. God says I am married to you in multiple places in the Old Testament because he is expressing to the Old Testament Israel the depth of the relationship that he feels with them. He loves them so much. He says, I'm married to you, which is a relationship, special relationship that only two people know about, a husband and a wife. And he often uses those words, husband and wife in the Old Testament. But a break in that relationship with himself through the sin of adultery or fornication is symbolic of disobedience to God. Now, if you're married, let's suppose I've used this illustration before and I'm going to do it again because I think it's a good one. You meet someone, you have attraction to them, you fall in love with them. That person, one or the other, says, Will you marry me? It's one of the happiest days of our lives, isn't it? Especially if you think it's the right one. Your families are in agreement. Everything is right. But then your spouse or your spouse-to-be or your fiancé says to you, I'm going to love you, I'm going to care for you, we're going to have children together, we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. But I just want one weekend a year where I go and do whatever I want to do and you don't ask any questions. Who would enter into a marriage like that? Put your hand up. For the benefit of those on Facebook and YouTube, no one has put their hand up. Why not? Because in a relationship like that, you want to have a complete relationship. You want to have a relationship of what they call total commitment. And when God talks about marriage to the Israelites in the Old Testament, he's talking about the same thing. He wants total commitment. He doesn't want any fornication. He doesn't want any adultery. He doesn't want any secrets. Not that you can keep secrets from God. Some people think they can. And so this is what it is talking about. And if we have a, have a look, now just write this one down. We won't look it up because we're a bit pressed for time today. Revelation chapter 14 verse 7 talks about worshipping him. And if you compare that in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 13, it talks about worshipping alien deities. We show our commitment and our love and the way we view our marriage relationship to God through our obedience. I remember years ago we used to have a guy living in our house who called himself a Hare Krishna. He loved being a Hare Krishna. But he was only a Hare Krishna on the weekends. During the week he didn't act like anything like a Hare Krishna and we used to call him a part-time Hare. Friends, are, we, are there any part-time Christians here today? I don't want you to put your hand up. But I just want you to ask yourself that question. Babylon has a great fall. In Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, 
as Israel backslid or fell in Jeremiah chapter 3 verses 6 to 8 by turning away from the true worship of God. It happened in the Old Testament. God is realizing that it could possibly happen again and it is embedded into the three angels' messages. Now you might recognize that this is an intensely personal message. It's talking to individuals. Even though the message goes to the entire world, it goes to individuals in the entire world. And then God says, I want to be married to you. I've got eternal life for you. I sent my son down on the cross for you. And I'm going to give you eternal life if you will worship me, if you'll enter into this relationship with me, if you'll recognise what I have done for you and if you will love me, I'll give you the entire universe for the rest of eternity. But he wants us to be so sure that we understand exactly what it is that he is saying that he also delivers a warning. He says, here's the path, walk ye in it, but here's to watch out for. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Friends, we need to figure out what this wine is. So what does this uh, papal system, not the people, the system, offer to the world that makes them deranged? And friends, I want to just underline something here. My wife and I, Bronwyn, used to live next door to a, a woman who was a beautiful woman. But she was an ex-Catholic nun. But we used to love having her come over. She was open, she was vivacious, she was friendly. And she used to come into our house all the time and have a cup of tea. Bronwyn's got a smile on her face. Because all you had to do was to have a two-hour conversation with this woman was say, hello, how are you? And off she'd go. She was fascinated with the fact that she had living next door to her a Protestant minister. And she would always be asking me questions. What is it that you, why do you believe this? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And I took the opportunity one day, once I got to know her, to go over to her house and sit down and open our Bibles. And we did a short study on Daniel chapter 2. And friends, I can tell you, she couldn't comprehend it. The earth was brass and the sky was bronze because the only thing that she could see was what she saw in Rome. So when this word deranged comes out, it's not deranged as in a mental illness, but a person can be so caught up, so connected to this way of life that they just can't conceive of anything else. And it made me realise, I think God put her in my pathway because it made me realise the power of putting aside the word of God and allowing the word of man to become. And so here is the warnings that the Bible gives us. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We know what Babylon is. We had a look at that. But let's have a look at what's in this glass of wine that makes people deranged. The Babylon church has effectively inserted itself into the salvation cycle. And that it turns people away from Christ and our only source of salvation and claims that salvation can only be found by coming to the church and practicing its works. Now this might not be very palatable for some people to hear. And friends, I would be happy to have a conversation with anyone that wants to talk about this in more detail later on. Let's have a look and see what these works are, these non-biblical practices that are promoted within this system that deranges the mind and covers the truth of salvation as revealed in Scripture. But friends, I want you to continue to entertain the context. This is a camouflage. This is a deception that God is revealing to us. Let me go through these. Number one, infant baptism. Bible doesn't say anything about baptizing infants. Number two, Lent, a penitential preparation for Easter. You know, it always amazes me when Easter comes around, we have Holy Thursday, Crucifixion Friday, Resurrection Sunday, and a Resurrection Holiday for Monday. Saturday, or the Sabbath, is never mentioned. It never comes up. 
Why do you think that is? It's a part of the camouflage, friends. It's a part of the camouflage. Venerating the saints. Praying to those who are dead and who can do nothing for you according to the Bible. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 strictly forbids praying to and worshipping the dead. We have the lighting of candles. Now, if, you go, if your power goes out at home and you light a candle, that's okay. But in a religious context, the lighting of a candle is like an idol symbolising the light of Christ. It takes our focus away from Christ and it puts it on the candle. Very, very subtle, but very, very powerful. We see Sunday worship, and friends, that is a, a topic all on its own. We see bowing down before idols, expressly forbidden in the commandments. We see the vestments, non-biblical, a hangover from, our pay, or from the pagan heritage. The Easter cross on the forehead, non-physical. Praying for and to the dead, expressly forbidden. Read Leviticus 19. Auricular confession which means confession into the ear. Friends, if you have a sin that needs to be forgiven, you confess it only to, to God. The rosary, repetitional, not from the heart. Jesus himself said they think they find their salvation through their many words. The sign of the cross. Friends, this one always has particularly interested me, and I'm not going to do it here in the pulpit, but it is the placing of the forefinger and the thumb and the, th and the third finger on the forehead, just on the upper chest, and then on each breast. If you draw a line between those four points, what do you get? I'll leave it to your imagination. Celibacy. Now, according to Paul, this should be optional, never mandated. Purgatory. Stuck between heaven and hell. You know, I remember years ago when I was doing my internship in Ipswich, this is going back into the late 80s now, I was dealing, and my pastor and I were dealing with a woman who was getting out of bed at 4 o'clock in the morning to go and work a job until 6.30 at a manufacturing company, and then she'd come home, have a quick breakfast, and then she'd go to a regular daytime job. And we said to her, why are you getting on your push bike, freezing cold in winter, in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of the night to do this second job? You don't need the money. She said, that money I'm giving to the church so I can get my husband who's just recently died out of purgatory. Nothing in the Bible about that, friends. And then we've got the mass transubstantiation the re uh, christ is re-sacrificed at every mass this system will tell you that when the preacher says certain latin words over the substance that he holds in his hands it is literally transferred into the body of christ literally it doesn't look like it but it is so Christ is sacrificed every time, re-sacrificed every time they have a mass. Friends, that is heresy of the highest order. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 tells us Christ was, was sacrificed how many times? Once for, for all. And the list goes on. Friends, I want to re-impress upon you, it is not the people. I had a lecturer at college once say to me, some popes from history who had their heart in the right place, they're going to be in heaven. God calls them my people. And we need to be sure that we understand these things that I have been talking to you about and we recognise that we need to go to the world armed with this information that increases our faith, that we can tell people, everybody, not just those that are a part of this system, Christ died for you. God wants you to follow him. God wants you to enter into this symbolic marriage relationship with him. That's how much he loves you. He wants you to be a part of his family in the kingdom. So this is a warning. This is God saying to us in the first angel's message, fear God, give glory to him, the hour of judgment will come and will worship him who made the heavens and the earth. But there are some camouflage, very, very well camouflaged things you need to look out for. And this is where they're coming from, from Babylon, and this is what they are. And friends, anything that you can find 
that is not in Scripture. Anything that you can find in the world that does not come from the Word of God can be fit into this same category. Leading people away from Christ. They do one of two things. They lead people towards Christ or they lead people away from Christ. Babylon, the enemy of God's true last day church, holds out in her hand the filthiness of her fornication, her doctrines and practices that effectively lead souls away from Christ and away from the pure truth of the Bible. They propose to make the whole world believe that salvation is found not in the righteousness of Christ, freely given to those who accept it, but in the practices and the superstitious traditions of the church. This system has effectively tried to place itself in between the individual and God. It's much easier than that. The second angel's message speaks these words, not in a loud voice. So these truths are specifically for those who have accepted the first message. Friends, I sometimes see people, I see churches who take books like Sunday Law, Sunday Worship, and they letterbox it around the, around the neighbourhood. It's not for new people. I would suggest to you, you'd be much better off taking a message of acceptance, taking a message of love, taking a message of the cross, taking a message of what Christ has done for you. Steps to Christ is an, a wonderful book, and I would be letterboxing that, the good news of the gospel, into these letterboxes. National Sunday Law, Sunday Sacredness, these things come later because if a person does not have the love of Christ in their hearts right from the very beginning, they're not going to accept the doctrine. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. Yeah? God wants those who worship him to worship him in spirit and in truth, the spirit is the heart and the mind is the truth. God wants your hearts. He doesn't want, your, he doesn't want anything else from you. He wants your heart. And the obedience will come as a natural outflowing from that relationship. Friends, if you are trying to be obedient to the law of God without first having the love of Christ in your life, then you are trying to get yourself to heaven through <coughs> works through works. I love this second angel's message and there's a third angel's message coming as well, which even has more interesting items to it. God wants each of us in his remnant day church to recognise that he is calling into your heart. Do you have unforgiven sins? Give them up to him. Do you feel as though there is something in your life that's not quite right? Give it up to him. Is there something that you have in your life that you're struggling with and you just can't seem to get past it and it's overcoming you? Friends, I will, far, I will tell you that joy and peace and release is a prayer away. But we must be the one to come to him. Unlike Satan, he will not coerce us. He calls us. We are a part of a last day church that has the most wonderful message to the world that anyone can deliver. A message of hope, a message of love, a message of peace, a message of joy, a message of freedom from sin. And we, as a people need to recognise that these things are not only for the world, it's for the whole world, so it's for out there, but it's also for, for in here. Friends, it's even for me. And I pray every day that the Lord will touch my heart, will take my sin away. And as I said before, with Howard and with Debbie, the ministry that they are doing is every bit the Lord's ministry is what I do standing here in the pulpit. And God has given each one of you your ministry. Have you found it yet? Have you asked him what it is? 
Have you called upon him to take away your sin, to fill you with his spirit, that we might partake of this wonderful knowledge that he has given us in scripture, the admonitions, the glory of his gospel, the warnings, watch out for this. Friends, God calls you through all this that you might commit yourself to him to take your sins to the cross, to bow at the cross and to call upon his name to fill you with his spirit that you might do his will and be ready for that day when Jesus comes again. Friends, this is my prayer for each one of you. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of your glory. We stand in awe of your love. And we see repeated through the pages of the Holy Scriptures time and time again, evidences, constant evidences of your glory that you are yearning to reveal to your people. I pray, Lord, that as we recognise the message and the mission for this church, it is prophetic. And for those who join, they have joined an organisation where God has, is the apple of God's eye and that he cares for his church as an instrument of salvation for all of those who live on this planet. I pray that we'll be aware of that and that, Lord, that we will humbly come before you and call on your name and ask the question, what might we do to be saved and what might we do to save others? I pray that each heart here has been touched with the power of the Holy Spirit, that we will go away from this place changed, recognising that God is calling each one of us to our work. Might we not shirk away might we say, here I am, Lord, send me. Bless us and strengthen us as we continue during these difficult and uncertain times, recognising the closeness of the day. Might we be daily making commitments to you and allowing you to use us for your glory is my prayer in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <laughs>